Good morning once again students. Today our topic for discussion is Terry John as you can see on the screen. What is Terry John? It is a fibrovascular lesion which grows from the conjunctiva onto the cornea. It has an apex where the head is found and of course the base where the body is found. Terrigium is also known as surface eye. Why? Because it is very common in surface because they are exposed to certain risk factors which we are going to talk about later on. Etymologically, Terrigium is a Greek, it comes from Greek and that it is called terigus terigus and terigus means wing look it looks like a wing the shape is like triangle okay with the apex like this and that is the base let's talk about epidemiology and some risk factors that are associated with the region so start with we're going to talk about the tropical regions in the world where it is the regions in the world where it is commonly found it is a very common disease within the tropical regions of the world why because of the sun and the sun is rich in ultraviolet radiations Notable among the ultraviolet radiations capable of causing terrigium include ultraviolet radiation B, the C, and the A. Of note is the fact that the ultraviolet radiation B and C are absorbed by the conjunctiva and the sclera. So the B and C are more prone to causing of terrigium. It is also important to know that ultraviolet radiation A is absorbed by the crystalline lens so much so that it is the one that causes cataract. In attempts to avoid the ultraviolet radiations A reaching the retina and destroying the photoreceptors, the crystalline lens absorbs it. But B and C are known to be causative agents of the region. Let us talk about gender distribution. Terrigium is twice as common in males than in females. In other words, in every two cases that might affect males, it might have affected females one female okay that's about racial distribution so no the fact is that an explanation here given for the male preponderance is that males do more outdoor work when i mean outdoor work their eyes are exposed to the sun to wind to dust to smoke that is why it is more common in males than in females now let's talk about racial distribution terrigium is said to be more common in the black race than in the white race factors given could be because of the source of the sun tropical areas so the more your skin is exposed to the sun, the darker your skin can become. So therefore, that is the theory. It is also thought that melanin may have a role to play as a risk factor for telegram development. Age distribution. It is very rare to find telegram in population that are younger than 20 years the reason is that the eye wouldn't have been exposed longer enough 
to the agents which are causative to get the the region. However, its highest incidence is between ages 20 and 40 years. Whereas its highest prevalence is found in those who are over 40 years of age. Okay. So, let's now talk about genetics. It is said that certain genes, that is MPP1, make people more predisposed to having terrigen. So genetically, somebody may have other risk factors but may never develop the terrigen because it doesn't have any genetic predisposition. Whilst other people may not be exposed to the well-known risk factors, yet they will get it because they have genetic predisposition. Recently, certain viruses have been associated with development of terrigen. What are they? Histopathology studies of several specimens excised by surgeons in theater of terrigen were sent for histopathological studies and to realize that two main viruses were commonly found in terrigen tissue. These were human papilloma virus and the herpes simplex virus. So therefore, there is also viral predisposition in terrigen development. So, it is important to also talk about other risk factors that may make an individual prone to having terrigen. Apart from ultraviolet radiation B and C that are from the sun, notable amongst the other risk factors are smoke. So if your eyes are usually exposed to smoke, it means that you have the risk factor of terrigen development. Of course, this is the sun that someone's eye is exposed to. So, I repeat, the major risk factors are we have the sun, dust, wind, and other particles from the environment that might act as toxins. As you can see in this picture, this terrigium is more nasally located. It's media or nasal. What is the evidence? The evidence is that, well, we can see the nose, but we know that there is a superior punctum, and that is the inferior punctum. So therefore, this becomes nasal terrigium. According to literatures, Terry and in fact those that I have seen severally in my practice. Terrigium is majority of terrigia are found at the nasal site. But certain factors contribute to the reason why they are found at the nasal aspect. That they are not easily to find at the superior site nor inferior conjunctiva not temporal conjunctiva, but more often than not, majority of terrigia are found nasally. We are going to talk about why. You may not easily find terrigium superiorly or inferiorly. Why? Because the eyelid, the eyelids are there to block passage of ultraviolet radiations onto the conjunctiva. The superior conjunctiva is covered by the superior eyelid. In fact, it lies about one millimeter below the superior lambus. I repeat, the superior eyelid lies one millimeter below the superior lambus. So, it is therefore difficult for travel radiations to cause damage at the conjunctiva for it to invade the cornea here. Let's come inferiorly. 
Again, the eyelid is found just at the margin of the inferior limbus. So therefore, it protects the conjunctiva from getting exposed to ultraviolet radiations. It's important to also note why pterygia do not easily get themselves developing at the superior and inferior limbus. For pterygium to develop, we need weakness or absence of limbar stem cells. Although limbar stem cells are found all over the limbus, it is important to note that the limbar stem cells are in their highest in intensity at the superior limbus and at the inferior limbus, finding themselves in what we call palisades of vault. Palisades of vault. What are palisades? Palisades are like defense walls, preventing invasion of noxious or unwanted growths from the conjunctiva onto the cornea. So, the limbar stem cells are in the highest intensity at the superior limbus and the inferior limbus, located within niche, their niche or their house. Their niche or their house is called palisade of vault. Palisade is a defensive wall which prevents invasion of disease from the conjunctiva onto the cornea. And that is exactly what the limbar stem cells that are in the highest intensity in the inferior and superior limbus do to prevent any disease from developing from the conjunctiva onto the cornea. So let's draw attention to the nasal and the temporal side. Why is it that pterygia are mostly found at the media or the nasal side and they are not mostly found at the temporal side. The factors given are four. Number one, we should remember that the temporal eyelashes, the temporal eyelashes are more numerous, elongated than the nasal eyelashes. So therefore, the temporal eyelashes are able to block the ultraviolet radiations when sand particles more than what the nasal eyelashes can do. Again, let's talk about drainage of tears. You realize that this is the superior pantum, that is the inferior pantum. Tears will naturally pass through them to be absorbed into the nasal mucosa. So, in other words, tears that are rich in lactoferrin, beta lysine, transferrin, all the enzymes that protect the surface of the eye and have antibacterial properties. But in effect, the tears collect all the debris from the surface of the eyeball, from the temporal area because the lacrimal gland is found temporarily and it has the highest thickness in the aqueous layer. So once it sweeps all the debris from the surface of the eyeball, sometimes it collects thousands that our eyes have been exposed to during the day from like our exposure to dust, to wind, to certain uh, pollution agents. It will have collected all these toxic agents brought them from the temporal to deposit them at the nasal side. That's when we get up in the morning. Sometimes you have discharge, but this will be more often than not found at the nasal side because it is made up of certain toxins. It therefore means that the nasal conjunctiva is more exposed to toxins than the temporal conjunctiva. That accounts for why pterygia develop more at the nasal side than the temporal side. Let's talk about the vascular theory. The vascular theory. It is said that all the risk factors that we've spoken about, 
they may not be able to cause teredrum unless there's some inflammatory component. Because before inflammation can take place, you need inflammatory cytokines. And the inflammatory cytokines need to pass through blood vessels. Now, let's pay our attention here. For our knowledge, we should know that the temporal conjunctiva benefits from one anterior ciliary artery, whereas the media conjunctiva anatomically has two ciliary arteries feeding it. So therefore, the one which is which has more blood vessels can send more inflammatory cytokines to site of inflammation and cause more territory. The fourth and the last but not the least is divergence of the eyeballs. As our eyes are exposed to the sun, you see the synchronesis of three major events when we look close into our palm, our watch. And this is one, our peoples get constricted, there is convergence, and of course, the eyeballs get closer uh, together, and so there is meiosis and of course, convergence. That is what is most important here. So when we look afar, which is the opposite action, assuming we are looking at the sun area where the sun is found, it's a distant thing. So the eyeballs naturally go into divergence. And this divergence makes the media part more exposed to the ultraviolet radiation than the temporal side. So that is the other risk factor that makes the location more media let's talk about types of terrigium terrigium may be atrophic atrophic or progressive which one is the atrophic one the atrophic terrigium is the one which is flat progresses very slowly in fact it can grow up to certain level after which it will stop or cease growing so it is flat progression is very slow and it is difficult to even realize that it has vascularity that is why it appears pale. On the other hand, we have progressive terrigium, which is elevated, fleshy, vascularized, and it is quite fast in progression. Within short period of time, it will have progressed from one stage to another. So this is trophic and that is progressive. Region may grow from the nasal to the temporal side and these two entities may grow towards each other touching. So we call it kissing teregia, the region. As you can see, one is touching from each, each other from different directions. There's another type, which is also called kissing terrigium, because the one to my left is coming from the nasal side, and this other one is coming from the opposite side, and they are getting together, although lips were touching. So this is called the kissing type of terrigium. Like any other structure, the region has its own parts. It has its own parts. Okay, so let's talk about the parts of the region. The advancing head. This is the advancing head of the terrigium. This is the advancing head. As you can see, we usually put caps on our head. So what you find here is known as the cap. 
the cap of the terrarium. In other books, it's known as the halo or the halo. What is the cap or the halo? It is a avascular zone which is found ahead or in front of the apex of the terrarium. So the avascular structure or <coughs> halo which is found ahead of the advancing head of the terrarium that is called the cap okay that is called the cap so the part of the terrarium which is found on the limbus is known as the neck the neck of the terrarium and the part which is found overlying the sclera or conjunctiva is known as the body the body so we have the cap which is here the head the neck at the limbar region okay and the body which is found in direct contact with the sclera there is something which you should also know about terrigen development you see the, the cornea is made up of five major layers. The most superficial layer is called the epithelium. epithelium. But the epithelium is rich in certain cells. Okay, One of them is called the surface cells or S cells, which is found at the most superficial part. Within four or five days, maximum one week, these surface cells are lost and they are replenished by new cells. Another type of cells are called the wing cells found at the wings. Okay, the wing cells. The last but not the least are the basal cells. The basal cells are of so much importance. Why? Because they are the cells that go through mitosis, cell division. To repopulate the lost surface cells. Of note is the fact that these basal cells are rich in iron. They are rich in iron. That is why some of the substances that you might find in tears acting as bactericidal agents are transferrin, lactoferrin, and so on. And all these particular structures uh, chemicals are what iron rich let's talk about iron once the cornea gets damaged the basal cells are supposed to go to go through process of mitosis divide themselves to repopulate the lost surface cells and once the cornea gets damaged it affects the mitosis of these uh, basal cells so the rate at which they lose the iron within them becomes faster so iron gets more exposed at the surface cells that is why in many corneal diseases or even when we are aging there have been several literatures that speak about iron lines that are found within the cornea. Let's talk about Stanley Hudson lines that is from iron deposition. Stanley Hudson lines, they may not be found here, but Stanley Hudson lines are iron deposits that may be found either in aging normal cornea or in cornea scars. Then we have flesh ring. Flesher rings are found at the base of what? Keratoconus. These are all iron lines. Then we have fairy ring. Fairy ring. These are found in drainage. So when an eye gets uh, glaucoma surgery done. Okay? So superiorly, you may have uh, blebs, draining blebs. Around the draining blebs on the cornea, you may find certain uh, 
iron lines and this will be called fairy ring the last but not the least and in fact the most important of so this presentation is concerned is the fact that as the pterygium continues advancing okay at the margin of the cap dividing the avascular halo dividing the cap from the normal cornea is a line and this line is known as stockest line stockest line stockest line so what is stockest line stockest line is a line which is found between the cap of the advancing pterygium and the normal cornea and this line is made up of iron which is usually found in the region so as you can look at it this is stockest line so when you hear stockest line it means that we are talking about iron deposition in the region so i repeat this will be stockest line that is the cap that is the avascular area found ahead or in front of the head of the pterygium so this is the head of the pterygium okay this is the lumbar area so that will be the neck sorry so that will be the neck and of course the body is found in direct contact with the sclera and conjunctiva Like all diseases that may be progressive, the region has stages. Okay, so we have stage one of the region, stage two up to stage four. In stage one, the region has just crossed the limbus. In stage two, as this one is found here, it is in stage two. Why is it stage 2? Because it is found midway between the pupillary margin and the limbus. This is the limbus and this is the pupillary margin. And the pterygium head is found in between, midway. We have stage 3. In stage 3, the pterygium has been able to reach the pupillary margin. That is the head. And then you have stage 4. In stage 4, it has Reach the apex of the cornea, that's reach the center of the cornea, that block the pupil, causing decline <coughs> visual acuity. There is something you should also know. Never say you have seen television until the lesion you have fibrovascular lesion, which is triangularly shaped, has crossed the limbus. If it has not crossed the limbus, then it is not pterygium. What are the symptoms that pterygium may present with? In fact, majority of pterygia are asymptomatic. They don't present with symptoms. The only reason why pterygium may present with symptoms is that it is what? Inflamed. In the absence of inflammation, pterygium may be asymptomatic. <clears throat> Another condition that may let pterygium become symptomatic, although it may not be inflamed, is when it causes astigmatism. Okay? In other words, it will cause with the rule astigmatism because it will flatten the horizontal meridian. So when it causes astigmatism, to give you symptoms even if it's not inflamed when it crosses the visual axis it will give you symptoms because you decline your vision just like the astigmatism although it may not be inflamed so if it's inflamed and or has crossed the has a stage four or it is causing astigmatism all these are sources of symptoms Let's test ask yourself what symptoms at all will pterygium produce? Ladies and gentlemen, 
Students, listen. Terrichon is like a foreign body on the ocular surface. Just imagine from your childhood. Is there anyone amongst you who has never had a foreign body entering his or her eye? If it has ever happened to you before, remember that as you had something entering your eye or something which entered your eye, the body in its wisdom will try to eliminate that particular structure. In one way, the body defended, defend, defends itself is to produce a lot of tears. So lacrimation or watering of the eyes becomes one of the symptoms. Number two, the area where the foreign body has fallen into will start going through a process of what? Inflammation. So rubber or redness will take place. Right? Good. Number three, you have what you call foreign body sensation. Of course, something has fallen into your eye. And that is not the normal locus of that particular foreign body. So you get foreign body sensation. Okay? A few people rub their eyes in form of itching. So that becomes one of the symptoms. Yes, if that foreign body stays for a longer period, it can cause what? blurring of vision so ladies and gentlemen don't just memorize this by heart just have logical thoughts about something you fell into your eye and that when something falls into your eye you have watery eyes okay or lacrimation foreign body sensation you may have itching you may have redness and you may have decline visual acuity as symptoms. Once you have foreign, you have symptoms of terrigium, okay, you can use few medications to reduce the symptoms. It is not a proper, proper foreign body per se. I use the foreign body aspect for your better understanding. So if it were just foreign body, we could just remove it easily, but it is not. So what do we do? We can use insects, topical insects, non steroid anti-inflammatory medications, okay? Novenac, Profenac, and its other derivatives. Or we can increase the use of medications. We can use weak steroids, okay, to quieten that inflammation and shrink the blood vessels we can also use lubrications okay as we get the region the rate at which tears the tear from get itself re-established on an even corneal surface is distorted is disturbed why because the irregularity that the region will cause on the ocular surface will be said that tears will not or the tear from will not re-establish itself at the area where the pterygium is found very well. That is why there is a need to add tear substitutes. What do we do when we have pterygium? In fact, the main treatment modality of pterygium is what? Surgical. It is surgical. But remember, it is not every pterygium that we send the patient to theater to work on or to remove. In other words, what are the indications of surgery in patients who have pterygium? Number one, remember that for cosmetic purposes, we want to remove the pterygium. It could even be stage one. But if it's found in a young lady who says she, you should remove it for her, that becomes a cosmetic indication, even if it's what stage one. Another indication is when the pterygium is causing a lot of with the rule astigmatism. In such a case, the patient will have distortions. Okay, the linear world will become very clumsy and difficult for the client. 
Another indication is when the visual acuity is declined. For example, maybe the data has stage 3 or stage 4 will have crossed the pupillary axis and block light passage to stimulate the photoreceptors. So, decline visual acuity from the region is an indication of what? Excision. Another indication is when the practitioner wants to examine certain diseases or certain parts of the eye that are posterior to the pterygium, the pterygium is blocking whatever the practitioner wants to visualize. So, if there is a lesion even in the anterior chamber or within the iris, or within the crystalline lens or vitreous or retina where the practitioner wants to visualize very well but the pterygium is blocking him in other words the practitioner needs to excise the pterygium to have better view of the portions that are posterior to it another indication is medical a patient has diabetes hypertension Stage 3, stage 4 pterygium, you cannot diagnose hypertensive or diabetic retinopathies. If the pterygium is there, it has to be what? Excite. Another indication is pterygium that may mimic other types of grooves. If they mimic other types of grooves, it means that we need to excise and send it for histopathology studies. So basically, these are the major indications of pterygium surgery. There are several surgical methods that can be used in pterygium surgery. It can be simple excision, where we just excise and throw the tissue away or send for histopathology studies. Or you can have excision with conjunctiva autograft. What is the rationale behind excision with conjunctiva autograft? So, when you excise the pterygium, okay, conjunctiva autograft means you are able to excise. So, after you've taken the pterygium away, you take the conjunctiva either from the inferior limbus, like this, making sure that you've gotten some limbal stem cells or you take from the superior limbus and then you come and place it at where the pterygium was found why do we do that we do that because pterygium developed in this direction because the limbal stem cells were weak deficient so therefore after we have inside the pterygium we want to fortify the barrier here with what limbal stem cells we want to bring the niche, one of the niches of palisades of what, which is rich in what? Rich in the limbal stem cells to come and replace the area where there's what? Weakness. Another method is excision with amniotic membrane transplant. Amniotic membrane, for your information, is very rich in limbal in stem cells or in stem cells so once you repopulate the area with amniotic membrane okay from the placenta you are repopulating the area before stem cells which will act as barrier for further to prevent further invasion of the cornea we also have excision with the use of antimetabolites Antimetabolites. So after you have excise, you use antimetabolites. There are two major antimetabolites that are in use, although there are several. I won't mention two, and this is 5 fluoruracil and mitomycin C. 5 fluoruracil and mitomycin C. What is an antimetabolite? An antimetabolite, at the way it goes, acts against metabolism. It is only through metabolism. Energy is acquired in form of adenosine triphosphate, that is ATP, and with energy, 
cells are able to go to mitosis, divide, and then growth takes place. So if there's a substance which is anti-metabolite, it is preventing the cell from going to metabolism. In that case, it is able to stop metabolism and mitosis to prevent regrowth of the terrigium. Now, let's have some little pictorial knowledge of how cell growth, cell growth is. Okay, so this is the cell cycle. Okay, cell cycle starts from G1 where metabolism will have taken place. So the cells start growing, okay? Then goes through S. S means synthesis. Synthesis of what? DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. So that is where it is synthesized. But within the cells, DNA is synthesized to be more specific within the nucleus. The nucleus is like the commander that which gives orders within the cells, the other parts of the cells. It gives orders to the other organelles. Okay, so that is it. So from phase S or synthesis phase, it goes towards G2. Okay, at G2, more growth takes place, preparing itself. To go to what you call the mitosis or cell division all right so in mitosis the cell divides into two and then it continues replicating and growth takes place tissues become bigger and larger so therefore if we have a substance we can arrest this cell cycle not in total but even if partially then you can avoid mitosis of cells and what regrowth. So that is exactly what the antimetabolites do. For example, mitomycin C. What does it do? It is able to arrest the cell cycle at the end of S phase and beginning of gene 2 I repeat it is able to arrest the cell cycle at the level of S phase and then what G2 to prevent what mitosis but when it comes to 5 fluoroviracy it is able to arrest cell cycle at the level of synthesis of what DNA so, for better understanding also, as the cell go through its cycle, from mitosis, okay, some cells may reach either gene 1 or gene 0. What does gene 0 mean here? Gene 0 means that although the cell perform its function, it will be stagnant, it will be reserved, it will be inactive. It doesn't want to divide anymore. Okay, so either you use mitomycin C or 5 any of them. Finally, even if there's mitosis, the cell might go into G0 where further mitosis will not take place for the rest of the cell life. But other cells may go toward G1 where to restart the cell cycle all over again and this may happen in individuals who have genetic predisposition but remember cell cycle is generally arrested at S phase and or G2 to prevent mitosis and regrowth of what terrigion why am I saying this it is important to know this because the most common complication of pterygium surgery is recurrence. Is what? Recurrence. But does pterygium recur in all clients? No. 
the recurring does not occur in all clients. The question now is, in which group of people is pterygium more recurrent? Okay, one, it has been observed that recurrence rate is high in the black population because they are more exposed to the sun. Ultraviolet radiation has been accumulated in the tissues already. And of course, melanin is said to play a role. So recurrence may be more common in the black race. Another group of population in which recurrence may be high is the youth. They are still in growth. So vascular endothelial growth factors are still actively participating in the person's growth system. The vessels continue rejuvenating, becoming bigger and larger. The person is still in growth. So therefore, mitosis is easy to recur. So that is why recurrence may be more in the younger population. Again, pterygium may recur more in people who have hypertrophic scars in any part of their skin. To have a hypertrophic scar means that somebody's skin has more propensity towards mitosis of the cells and so therefore regrowth of pterygium in such a person shouldn't be a big surprise. Another group of people who might be prone to recurrence are, for example, if patient A came with the right eye with pterygium, I did excision. After a few years, if the right eye pterygium, which I size, recurs, it means that in future, if it comes with pterygium in the left eye, and I size more likely or most likely in the left eye, there will be recurrence because the person might have a triggering factor which could be genetic exposure to sunlight, wind, pollen, toxins in the environment, smoke. That triggering factor the patient is exposed to is within his or her environment and it will continue acting as source of pterygium development. So these are the major groups in which recurrence may, might be common. Let's talk about differential diagnosis of pterygium. Differential diagnosis of pterygium. We can grossly divide the differential diagnosis into benign lesions and malignant lesions. Which benign lesions may mimic pterygium? We have nodular scleritis, pseudopterygium, pinguiculum, to be more specific, more specific, elevated pinguiculum, cornea flictenule, cornea flictenule, I repeat, nodular sclerosis, pseudopterygium, pinguiculum, which is elevated, and then cornea flictenule. Which malignant lesions may mimic pterygium? Squamous cell carcinoma of the limbus. Okay, squamous cell carcinoma of the limbus. And then a melanotic melanoma from the conjunctiva. So, students, as we drive to the end of our discussion, okay, I want to show you that. For example, this is before surgery, this is after surgery. Look at how nicely the eyes have become. So it is one of the most wonderful surgeries in eye care. This is before surgery and that is after surgery. Look at how neat and how beautiful the eyeball has become. Okay, but remember our aim is not to treat if there's prevention. What do we do? All the ultraviolet radiation, BCA, their wavelengths are more than 400. Okay, 400 nanometers. So 
if the wavelength length is more than 400 microns, it is therefore important that we are able to prevent this ultraviolet radiation, therefore prevention. What do we do? If we get sunglasses, we wear them all the time, it will prevent us. To prevent our eyes from getting exposed, not only to the ultraviolet radiations, but to smoke, to dust, other toxins within the environment. Okay, prevention. We can also prevent pterygium formation by wearing a wide brim hat. You see, as the lady is in the sun, you realize that the wide brim hat is preventing the sun rays from even entering her eyes. So, students, I thank you very much for your rapt attention. And until we meet again, learn these slides. It will be of so much importance to you. Thank you very much. And we will meet in class. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you.